so much. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar faces, although it is virtually. Um, we're glad that you're all joining us this morning. Uh, I have the wonderful task of bragging a little bit about SACAC, the organization bringing you this morning's wonderful workshop. And so I think that it's always important to kind of review the vision and the mission statement for a professional organization. Um, we all have busy lives. We have demanding jobs. We have lives outside of our professions. And so um, if you're going to be a part of an organization, uh, you want to make sure that it aligns with your values and brings some um, additional value to your life. And so I think a vision and a mission statement is a great place to start with any membership organization. So the vision statement for SACAC is SACAC strives for excellence in the highest ethical path, binding students and educational professionals in the common cause of post-secondary success. The mission statement reads, SACAC supports and engages its collaborative network of enrollment and counseling professionals by promoting ethical responsibility, professional growth, access, advocacy, and outreach to help all students realize their post-secondary educational goals. Now, if you're like me, you're one of those people that think, okay, what does that really mean? What does that mean? What does SACAC do, right? So let's talk about the strategic priorities of SACAC. One, expand outreach to public school counselors and CBO, community-based organization members. Provide widely accessible professional development opportunities, like the one we're all on today, and services to all current and potential members. Develop new and enhance existing state and area-based initiatives and create greater awareness of SACAC at the state level, why I am on the agenda for today. Develop innovative uses of technology and enhance communications and engage members and cultivate leadership through the activities of the association. Personally, number five resonates with me. Uh, I have been a member of SACAC for several years now, and I started, you know, just as someone that volunteered at a super conference. I served on faculty uh, for several professional development uh, programs, which we're going to talk a, a little bit about a little bit later. And this year, I am on the slate to be approved next week at the annual conference for board of directors. So if you had asked me, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So if you had asked me, you know, six years ago when I started in SACAC, if I would ever be there, I would definitely tell you, probably not. Um, but it was because of all the people that I've met along the way um, in SACAC and all of the opportunities that I've been given through SACAC that I'm even at this position to know people that have been on the board before, who have served on committees, um, who have also served at the national level. As we know, SACAC is the Southern Regional um, Association of NACAC, the national organization, um, and just kind of learn from them and hear from them and see their experiences and how SACAC has really enhanced their professional um, and really personal lives um, has been a great example for me. And so um, this definitely is one of those years where I can kind of stand back and really um, appreciate what SACAC has done for me, both um, professionally and personally, as I've made so many um, good friends out of uh, people who started off as colleagues in SACAC. So again, we're all busy professionals. We have demanding uh, jobs, whether we're on the college side or on the high school side, or we work for a community-based organization. Um, personally, I'm a wife, mom, full-time doctoral student, you know, have organizations that I'm a part of. And so if I'm going to join something or commit myself to something, there is a little bit in the back of my mind of what is in it for me? Um, sometimes we think that's a negative thing, but honestly, at this juncture in our lives, that's not a bad question to ask when we're looking at an organization and how much time we wanna commit to the organization. So I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with SACAC, um, to go to the website, that's SACAC.org and look specifically under professional development and events and resources and grants. Now I'll just give you a couple of examples because if you go to the website and kind of hover over those uh, subjects, you'll see that there's quite a bit there. And so one thing you uh, should hear about throughout the day is our annual conference, which is actually coming up next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And registration is actually still available because it is completely virtual. 
So I know COVID-19 has definitely disrupted our lives, maybe in some not so fun ways. But one thing that it has done for at least this organization is, you know, pushed us to put things um, online and to have more virtual events. And of course, that makes it more accessible to more people, right? So if you're at an institution or a school that maybe doesn't have a ton of funds to um, afford you the opportunity to travel and participate in lots of things, um, this is really a good time to um, get involved with SACAC and really um, be aware of the opportunities that are available because many of them are going to be virtual and more accessible for you. So the annual conference this year, another great feature is that registration is free for SACAC members, public high school counselors, HBCU employees, and reps from community-based organizations. So those are lots of different groups that will be able to participate virtually in the annual conference next week for free. Now you may be thinking, I don't fall into any of those categories. Well, let me give you a super easy way to fall into one of those categories, and it is to join SACAC. It is only, only, only $45 for the year. And so when you talk to people that are involved in SACAC and talk about and ask them about, you know, what value has it uh, brought to you professionally, you will see that it is well worth the $45 a year to be a member of SACAC. And so again, membership is only $45. Go ahead, join or renew your membership. Maybe you remember last year you hadn't renewed yet. Go ahead, renew your membership and get registered for annual conference. Uh, one of the highlights of annual conference this year will be keynote speaker, Dr. Anthony Abram Jack, who is an award-winning sociologist and author of The Privileged Poor. So you definitely don't want to miss um, his keynote address, um, the new NAC Act. Um, some new NACAC staff uh, members will be joining us as well. And so it's just going to be a really good opportunity, one, to learn some things, but two, see some people that you may not have seen in a while, because we'll have special interest group meetings, a uh, rural and small town counselors, independent education consultants, public school counselors, independent school counselors will have their own time to meet and to collaborate um, with each other. So you definitely don't want to miss the opportunity to network and to reach out. And then, of course, we'll have our state meetings. So each state in SACAC has time during the annual conference to meet together. And so kind of like we're doing right now, um, Arkansas will have time to have a state meeting where everyone registered can get together and kind of talk about uh, things that are going on in the state, things that are going on in SACAC, how we can become more involved in SACAC and bring more SACAC programming to Arkansas and to our colleagues uh, throughout the state. So annual conference, register if you're not a member, become a member so you can register for free. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, what will be under resources and grants on that website. So um, you know, there's a lot going on. Obviously, we're coming out of a period where we were under one presidential administration and a lot of our policies maybe um, shifted into a direction that may have caused some challenges for us as uh, college counseling professionals. And so now we're under a new administration. So some of those things are kind of maybe shifting in another direction. And so you want to be sure that you have resources, information, updates, so that you can really assist your students in whatever um, transitions or however it, these things may impact them on your particular campus. And so those resources are gonna be available to you um, as a SACAC member. Now, of course, anybody can go to the website and look at these things for free, right? But what are the chances that you're gonna stop what you're doing and think about, oh, this is going on nationally. Let me go see what resources are available and actually take the time and research and check it out. We're so busy that I know I personally wouldn't wanna take that chance and think that I'm gonna actually actively do that. But being a member of SACAC, those things are coming to me. I don't have to go look for them because I'm getting those email updates I know other people that can, you know, shoot me an email, shoot me a text and be like, hey, what do you think about this? How is it affecting the students on your campus or your ability to work or your recruiters or your counselors abilities to do their job? And so those conversations and those topics are coming to me instead of me kind of um, taking the time and taking the initiative to maybe go out and, and look up and, and check out all of those things. 
So if anything, SACAC is going to give you kind of access to colleagues that you can network with and bounce ideas off. And, and just, you know, for me, a lot of last year has been just doing a check-in and being like, okay, am I crazy? Or do you feel like this? Or are your students responding like this? Or is your staff struggling with this? And just kind of helping me honestly be a little, just stay sane maintain my sanity um, over the last year, but also making sure that you're up to date with what's going on nationally and, you know, how those things may impact uh, your students and your particular campus. So again, if I haven't said it already, if you're not a SACAC member, make sure you join SACAC. Um, annual conference is coming up. We have other opportunities coming up this year as well. Summer seminar, which is for counselors, it's professional development. I've been on faculty for summer seminar and it's amazing. Um, and so you just wanna be in the know, you wanna have access to all of these things and being a SACAC member is one way to do that. So I'll be on for the duration of this uh, program. So if you have questions, um, or, you know, just need some additional information, feel free to reach out to me. Um, also, after this, of course, feel free to reach out, and um, I'd be glad to help you on your path to um, SACAC and becoming a member. Thank you so much, Matt. All right. Thank you, Pamela, uh, not just for the presentation, but for all that you've done for SACAC in the state of Arkansas, and I uh, think everybody uh, joins me in congratulating you on your board elect position. So that's exciting. Look forward to um, all the good work you'll do there. And uh, now speaking of good work, we have our first of two presentations. And um, I hope everybody's okay if we run a little ahead of schedule uh, this morning. Um, uh, I don't think anybody's ever complained about that, but um, I do have the... Um, Distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Ryan Cassell to everybody. Uh, he is a new face in Arkansas, um, but um, those of you who have been around SACAC for a little bit will uh, recognize Ryan and know him well. So I will let him tell more of his story, uh, but look forward to hearing from you, Ryan. Thank you so much, Matthew, and also uh, Pamela for kicking us off. Um, I'm Ryan Castle, um, and uh, new uh, here in the state. So I am so pleased to be here, and um, I was was flattered uh, with the invitation to to say a few words uh, at, uh, in in the program today. I uh, now the title of my of this talk is "What's New," and the answer is everything. It seems like it's new. But on my screen are some faces I know, but some faces I don't know. You all probably know each other already. So if I may, I'd love to do just a quick run through on the screen and uh, for folks to just say your name and, and where you work. So you'll hear more from me later. So I've heard from Pamela already. Um, Next, well, let's see, even though I know some of you, I'm still gonna call on you, Emily. <laughs> hey everybody, uh, my name is Emily Coffey and I am in my third year of college counseling at Mount St. Mary in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Catherine? I think I'm the imposter on the call. My name is Catherine Chastain and I work um, at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, but I have the pleasure of serving as one of the co-chairs for State Neary Initiatives. Um, and my co-chair works with Arkansas predominantly, but I wanted to jump on and support this amazing SAI team in Arkansas. So thanks for letting me be here and learn. Yeah, it's good to see you today. Uh, Elizabeth. Hey y'all, I'm Elizabeth Hill. This is my second year of being a college counselor at Little Rock Christian Academy in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Trisha? Y'all, I couldn't find the mute button. I'm so used to Google Meet. So I'm like, it's not in the same place. Um, <laughs> I'm Trisha Morgan. I'm at Episcopal Collegian in Little Rock. Phil Hooper, does this look bizarre to you to see where I'm sitting right now? This is Phil's old desk, old office, old penance. And so I'm really, I'm just filling his spot basically here. But I've been at Episcopal for a while now. But it's good to see everyone. Most of you I know. 
Uh, Vivian. Like Trisha, I had a hard time finding that unmute thing. So I'm actually sitting in what was Trisha's old office when Phil was here, and it's not decorated, but I'm going to be decorating and playing the space. Phil chatted me and said, looks like you're in a closet. I'm like, no, I'm in Trisha's old office. <laughs> so it's been a little fruit basket turnover here, but um, this is my first, I'm just finishing my first full year of college counseling here at Episcopal Collegiate School, um, and it's been great. So I'm following in some wonderful footsteps of Phil and Trisha. Had great mentors. Good. And then it's listed as SACAC Zoom, but we heard from Matthew earlier. So thank you. And I love the color coding of your books in the background. That, that's, I, I'm not that organized of a person, but it's very satisfying to me to see that. Uh, let's see. Uh, We've established I'm not that organized a person either. So uh, y'all can thank my wife for the lovely background. <laughs> oh, let's see, uh, Nathaniel? It's okay, I know where the uh, mute button is. <laughs> um, I am Nathaniel Hayes and I work with KIPP Delta Public Schools and I was a college counselor here for a year and now I work with the alumni persistence team. Great, great to see you. Michael? Uh, my name is Michael Smith. I'm a career coach at Tuckerman High School. Uh, this is my 10th graduating class and my ninth year here. So. All right, great. Good to see you. Uh, Phil? Good morning, everyone. Phil Hooper. I'm at Thaden School in Bentonville, Arkansas. All right, and welcome back to Arkansas. And Fred. Well, good morning, y'all. I'm Fred Baker. I'm at Catholic High School for Boys. Um, I do the college counseling here. And uh, as of this year, I'm also teaching. So in a little bit, I'm going to be heading out to go teach an American Civil War history class, which the boys are riveted by. Uh, but I'm having fun doing. All right, that's all uh, I see on the screen. I'm making sure there's no one hiding or not a second screen or anything. We, we got everyone, right? All right, perfect. Well, I did prepare some slides, so let me see if I can get those shared. Uh, I hope you're not expecting any riveting slides, uh, but just a few few on the screen. Hopefully I'll get them on the screen. This is certainly, okay, where is it? Now you're, are you all just seeing my, my desktop now? All right, see the thumbs up from Phil. Let me get this to, Swapped out. All right, we in good shape. Can you see the opening slide? Okay, great. So uh, just to share where I where I am, I'm in my office here, and I have three monitors. So sometimes I get confused of where things are. Your faces are to the right. So if you see me turning my head it's to make sure that you're smiling at places you're supposed to smile and laughing. Um, so that's what's going on here. And then on my other screen, I have a very, very loose outline. So thank you all for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. It's a pleasure to be in Arkansas. Uh, when, when I was asked to, to say a few words at this morning's session, you know, I really struggled. Matthew will tell you there were a couple of emails back and forth of, I don't know what I have to share to offer. I'm the new guy. What in the world could I share with this group that might be meaningful at all? And so we ended up centering around what is new. And the more I started thinking about it, it's like, it seems like almost everything is new in our, in our world right now. And so today, just going to go through some, um, you know, I want to sh share with you a little bit about myself. I want to sh uh, talk about some of the ways that, uh, at least through my eyes and my experience, we uh, have ventured into new areas and new considerations and new worries and new opportunities. 
Uh, this by no means is this going to be a Hendrix centric uh, conversation. There will be some examples from it and seeing the faces on my screen of some Hendrix folks out there. I hope I don't bring shame to the institution. Uh, I'll try not to embarrass uh, us. Uh, but something to know, I'm pretty casual. If you were expecting a real sophisticated research-based presentation, you're going to be highly disappointed. But what I will be sharing is just some um, experiences of I, I've had a little bit about myself. And then I sure hope there's time at the end if, if, if there are any questions that you have for me uh, that, that we'll have time for that. So let's jump in. What's new? I'm new. So a little bit about myself. Um, you know, I am from central Indiana and I, I used to be a school counselor. I was a college counselor at Brebuff Jesuit um, in Indianapolis uh, for seven years. I was at Brebuff for seven years. First two, I taught full time. And then the, the last five, I was a college counselor and a, and a teacher. Uh, I sort of fell into the profession by accident. Uh, our, our principal was reorganizing the counseling office and divided it into more academic and then specific college counseling. And in grad school, I had had a little stint in, uh, in an admission office, like eight weeks in a, of a practicum in an admission office. And so I proposed to the principal, I said, hey, how about I do uh, two half and half? Now, those of you working in it, we all work in education. So there's never a half and half. So it was like three, two, three quarters jobs. But it was a wonderful experience, worked with wonderful people, wonderful schools. And then really that's how I ventured into this uh, into this profession. And after that experience, uh, my path took me to Swanee uh, in, um, in the University of the South in Swanee, Tennessee. I know there's a Swanee grad in here on the screen as well. So uh, uh, had a wonderful experience there. It is my wife's alma mater. That was my introduction to it. And, and that's really how I got introduced to the idea of a small liberal arts atmosphere. Uh, my own experience, I went to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, so big comprehensive university. It was a good experience for me. It was the right place at the right time. Um, I was first generation, you know, going to college. I didn't even look at private schools because I thought there's no way my mom could afford that. Um, so certainly no regrets from Ball State. But what I learned is that, you know, when we, when we moved to Swanee, it, my wife had been gone for about 20 years and she was encountering professors who still remembered her name 20 years later. And I thought, oh, that's, that's amazing. So I, I, even though it's not my own background, I really feel most at home in this small college, small liberal arts environment. I was at Swanee for 11 years, started as an assistant director and then just um, um, moved around doing various roles, um, never seemed to really drop responsibilities as time progressed, but most recently was associate dean in the office. When, you know, one day, I, gosh, just over a year ago now, it's probably in January, I got a call from, from someone said, Ryan, have you ever heard of Hendricks College? I said, well, yeah, we've, you know, we play them, um, you know, in sports or in the same athletic conference. Actually, it was the only conference school I had never visited uh, before. I'd been to all of our other conference schools. Um, and they said, well, they, they, they're exploring going a different direction with uh, admissions and enrollment. And I was talking to the president, just wondering if you want a conversation. And I said, well, I'm never going to turn down a conversation. And so started um, some phone call exchange emails. One thing led to another, did a, um, a visit uh, here in February of 2020, and the opportunity presented itself to be here. Moved here on May 18th, started on May 26th, and I've been here just over or just under a year. And sometimes it seems like it's been just a couple weeks, and sometimes in this world and era we're living in, I feel like I've been here five years. Uh, but it's been a wonderful experience so far. Um, Coming in, what were some immediate challenges, or as I like to call them, opportunities? You know, I knew that I that you know we were going to be under a microscope, and I think a lot of enrollment offices are under a microscope right now uh, for a variety of reasons. Some we'll get into today of just thinking about enrollment goals, and you know, I'm a pretty transparent person, very open book. You know, um, you know, Hendricks had seen some declining enrollment, and 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 there there is a goal to to reverse that, 
And so there are some pretty aggressive goals um, uh, in, in front of us. Um, just before I came, uh, the board made the decision to reset tuition. You know, Hendricks was working under a model that many, you know, tuition driven colleges work under this high, high tuition model, like pushing over 60,000 for tuition plus room and board, high tuition, high costs, high, high discount. And, and that's an unsustainable model. You know, it's, you know, it works sometimes, uh, but, but overall it's not really sustainable. Um, and, and, you know, with the sticker price, published costs, as you might say, of pushing over $60,000, the belief was, and I think it's a right belief, that many students, many talented students who would thrive here and thrive other places, we're not the only school who's done a tuition reset, we're dismissing even looking at us because of, of, the, of the cost. And so the tuition went from around $46,000 down to uh, $33,000. Uh, that's for the tuition. Then room and board would be on top of that, of course. So the decision was made to do that right before I came, but the details hadn't been worked out. And so as we all know, the devil is always in the details. So we had questions such as, you know, will this be for just new students or will it be for returning students as well? How are we going to communicate this to our different constituents groups, to our uh, uh, alumni group, uh, to our college counselors, to the prospective families? Um, how are the most recent graduates going to feel having just been on a model where, you know, that, that high tuition, high, high cost model? And so we, my first number of weeks, countless hours in meetings working on that tuition reset and uh, where we did land, um, just to kind of close that book on the question I, I posed earlier was it was just going to be for new students and and for the returners would stay under their current cost and discount or scholarship aid model. Um, now the truth is the new students in the new model really aren't paying that much more than the returning students but that's hard to understand. If we reduce the, the tuition for the returners, there would also have to be an adjustment on the aid side of it. Um, because keeping the high discount, keeping the highest aid possible, uh, it just wasn't gonna work because we, you know, as an independent school, well, all schools, it takes resources to run. Uh, so we did work under that model. It seems to have uh, been accepted pretty well. Um, but one thing we did do thinking about the returners was um, asking, you know, what can we do for them? We know that at first glance, it's going to appear like the new students are going to be paying less, even though the reality was they really weren't. Um, also, we know that they're, they're their experience had been disrupted. Um, the students were all sent home in March around spring break time for what was the longest spring break ever, although it wasn't a fun spring break as you know some you know we like to think of as spring break. Uh, Hendrix was we were all remote in the fall. Uh, we just felt like there there wasn't to you know cases were spiking in late summer. We felt like the testing turnaround time for surveillance just wasn't where it needed to be at the time. Of course, vaccines weren't anywhere close on the horizon, so our students were all remote. And so what we did do for our returners is we introduced a program called Hendrix Five. And, and so what we're saying is anyone who's, who is enrolled this academic year, we know their experience has been disrupted and we want them to be able to have more of the, per, of the experience that you know, we talked about at the time of recruitment. So any student enrolled right now can stay a fifth year at Hendrix at, uh, at zero tuition costs. Now there would be the expectation that they would live on campus and have the room uh, for the room and board piece. Um, you know, students who hadn't earned a degree yet would still be able to use any, you know, eligible, any 
federal or state aid that that they would have at their disposal, but there would be zero costs for the tuition. And we have had around 25 students take us up on that. Uh, so there are around 25 students who next year are going to be extending their experience through this Hendrix 5 option. So coming on board had some uh, immediate opportunities that, uh, that we were able to navigate um, together here on campus. Um, what else is new? Uh, many of our staff are new. Uh, I think it was my second or third day, there was a, um, one of our admission counselors uh, sent me a, a message online, said, Ryan, can we talk? And anytime you're in a supervisory role and someone says, can we talk? You think, oh, what's going on? Well, he told me, you know, he was leaving. Um, and then there was at least one more that left. There was an open position. So we had a lot of hiring to do. And, and so there was an opportunity here where I'm a firm believer in um, involving many of the staff on the hiring as opposed to it just be at the dean or the director level because this, it, we're, it, we're bringing someone into our community. And, and so that was uh, something that we did do is we involved the whole staff in that hiring process. So around half of our recruitment staff um, are, is new here. That meant staff development. You know, how are we going to, to build together? How are we going to uh, get to know one another? And I'm gonna talk about admission programming and events here in a few moments. Many of you know that fall season, typically we would all be on the road. We would wave goodbye to one another around Labor Day and maybe see each other all, to, the staff all together in November. Um, but the COVID, of course, you know, I, I try to find silver linings in any situation. And what COVID did allow for is our staff to be all together um, in, the, in the fall, as opposed to all being on the road. So continued staff development uh, has been a theme all throughout the course of this year. And so these next few slides, just going to share with you some of the, um, the things that I've told the staff as they've come on board and things that we try to reiterate here uh, within, our own, within our own community. Um, now, I do want to say one of the new staff members is our enrollment communications and marketing guy. Um, so these slides are very elementary. I am not a graphic designer, so don't judge me uh, for the, the rudimentary slides that you are seeing. Um, but something I've told the staff is that uh, uh, we need to find joy in what we're doing. If we are not having uh, joy, then, then we're doing something wrong. Um, and so that is something that, you know, I, I have told the staff early on, we need to find moments to celebrate, you know, whether it be a rise in applications that we've seen, whether it be the increase in, so far, the increase in deposits that we are witnessing, um, whether it be, you know, just someone having a great visit and engagement with a family, we need to share those moments with one another and take, take the opportunities to, to step aside from our screens and in a safe way as possible, you know, pop that bottle of champagne every once in a while. Or as yesterday, one of our new staff members brought in peach cobbler to share with the group. And so joy is something that is really important to me. And, um, and that's something that I've, you know, really trying to foster in this group. Um, something else I introduced to the staff pretty on, early on, and, and this is, um, you know, this is, I, I, I'll tell you, I don't read as much as I should, uh, but, but one book that I read, a, um, you know, a few years ago that really stuck with me is How to Raise an Adult by Julie Lithcott Haynes. And, and there's a section in there that really hit home for me as an educator and for me as a parent. And, and I'm a dad of, uh, my wife and I have four kids, uh, so all teenagers right now, uh, one headed off to college next year. Uh, but in this book, the author talks about the idea of a wildflower versus an orchid versus an orchid. And so as we think about what sorts of students we're recruiting, you know, I've encouraged the staff, think about the wildflowers, you know, and my undergraduate degree is in biology. And so I have, you know, an interest in um, the environment and ecology. So if you think about a wildflower, that, that is, that is uh, an organism that can thrive in a variety of different conditions you know, different soil temperature, or excuse me, uh, uh, soil moisture level levels, different temperatures, different sunlight levels. 
it's going to grow and bloom where, where it's planted versus an orchid being a, a plant where, you know, if you just turn it the wrong way slightly in the, on your windowsill, you know, it's going to die. It, very narrow conditions uh, have to be met for it to thrive. And so something I've encouraged the staff uh, you know, to look for as we're recruiting and working with students and also encourage the staff to be, and me as a dad, trying to raise wildflowers. Um, you know, another, and my kids don't love to hear this third bullet point, but uh, something else the author mentions is that, you know, some research in, you know, successful people, and, and success can be measured in so many different ways, certainly not just you know, financial success, but the idea of being a positive contributor to a community and to society. One common characteristic of those individuals is they had chores as kids. And um, again, as a parent, I've uh, tried to create many of those opportunities for chores at home. But, uh, and, and as we're talking with students one-on-one, -on -one, I don't like to really use the word interview because I think there's unnecessary stress put on the idea of an admission interview, but just a conversation. I love to ask students, what are your chores at home? You know, and if they have to really think about it for a minute uh, or longer, um, you know, that causes me to pause a little bit. Certainly doesn't mean that that student's not gonna be offered admission here or, you know, where else at other places I've worked, but it, it if a student's able to say, oh, well, I'm responsible for this, 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 and this, it gives me just a little added sense of confidence that that student is going to be able to find success. And so the, I, these are some things that I've shared with the staff, you know, to, to look for as we're working with students and families. Um, there's something else, you know, work ethic I like to think about, you know, if, a, if, if you think there has to be a better way, there probably is. Um, I, I know pretty early on, I, I walked by someone here in, in the office and, you know, just walked by her desk. I'm like, oh, well, you know, Felicia, what are you working on? She said, I'm hand typing all of the parent data from the admission that have come from the admission database and hand typing it into the main student information system. I said, you're doing what? I said, we have a like, this is all electronic. I, I said, there's got to be an import with this. And so, you know, if, if we can work smarter rather than harder, that's the direction I want to go. And, and sometimes it's just someone hasn't asked, you know, if there is a better way, it, you know, so sometimes we just get, um, you know, so stuck in the way, ways that we've done it. Me too, you know. Um, so I've encouraged staff to ask if there's a better way. And if we think there might be to, to that, let's explore it together. Also minimize the exceptions, you know, so, you know, we, we what else is new? Well, we have a relatively new admi admission database. Um, and so we're in our second year of that. And so thinking about how to use technology more as our friend, you know, if, if there are some certain exceptions that we like to keep track of with students, or for example of, oh, we need to remember that this student is, you know, uh, in this category. You know, instead of the old fashioned, you know, post-it note on your computer screen, let's figure out a way to, to work in a, a technology solution for that. And because it's the exceptions where, where mistakes tend to happen. And all of this is centered around the idea of building efficiencies. You know, if, if, if there's a way that we've manually done things in the past, let's explore, is, is, there, is there a more efficient way to do it? There might not be, but let's at least ask the question and explore it. And of course, document, you know, because as, as much as we all think that, you know, we're, we may be at a place forever and we're always gonna remember it, uh, that's not always the case. And, you know, and something I, you know, as, as I was leaving my old institution, you know, I, I really did my best to document processes and, and things because I'm also a firm believer that if, if I leave a, a community and people are left asking, how did we do this? How did we do that? Or things get dropped. I haven't done a good job as, as, a, as a community member if, if there's a struggle after I leave. And so creating, standardizing, and documenting processes, that, that is something that's really important to me. And I've tried to communicate that with the staff. 
Um, using data, but you know, and I want and I highlight with the group data informed versus data driven. Um, and, and, and another example to what you can think of that is kind of the blending between, you know, our profession, our field being an art and a science. If we're only looking at students at numbers, that's not very personable. That's not why we enter this place, but also the, the stats, the data need to inform what decision that, that we're making. And also back on the you know idea of our new our new platform our new uh, admission database that we use for admission review for communication for keeping track of things, you know the idea of the hygiene and the quality has got to be just of the utmost importance. Um, I'm not a carpenter, but I know the phrase uh, measure twice and cut once. Uh, otherwise, you'll measure once and cuss twice. So as we're reviewing, uh, you know one example. Every year, college winds up in, in the headlines. Uh, one college just last week sent an email uh, referencing ed being admitted to, what was it? Was it like 500,000 people? It was something just ridiculous. And I sent that news article out of Inside Higher Ed to the staff. I'm like, thank you for being patient with me as I insist on looking at every recipient list that goes out, especially if it, re if it references being admitted. Um, and then uh, as we have new ideas, we, you know, back it up with data. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, this is a great idea. I feel we should do this. You know, I love feelings, but let's back that up with data. And, you know, I was so proud of one of our new admission counselors uh, this, this year, Elon Epps is her name. Uh, she, she recognized a void in, in our Hendrix, uh, at least the current model. Um, I know some of you have been in the office before. I'm not sure exactly what all the programming used to be, but at least on the current programming model, we, we didn't have anything that focused on inclusion and access. And so Elon saw a need for this. And you know, she worked with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion to develop a program called Vision that, that we're where we wanted you know, students who come from underrepresented backgrounds, whether that be from racial or ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic, religious, geographic perhaps, um, you know, sexual um, orientation or identity. And she, she worked so hard, she planned this meeting uh, with me and our director and she backed it up. She's like, this is where our applicant pool looks like. This would be the target audience. These are the numbers we're looking at. And she put together with this program, collaborating with some others on campus, and it was a great success. It was virtual, look forward to it being in person. But I've encouraged the staff to back up the proposals with, with data. Um, and something else I you know, encouraged the staff to do, show grace, ask for help. A grad school professor told me once that it's just as easy to keep the top half of your tank full than it is uh, the bottom half of your gas tank. Um, I have to tell you, in my household, there's disagreement about this. If I see like a third of a tank, I'm looking for the next gas station because I'm going to worry about running out of gas. Uh, my wife is okay with that light going on and the, the mileage counter show up on the dashboard. I, I can't handle the mileage counter showing up on the dashboard showing me how, uh, how close I am to my impending doom of running out of gas. But I think about it in the energy perspective. And so, you know, a phrase that I've, 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 I've just been so flattered by this to hear some of the, some of the staff talk to one another and like, how's your tank? And, you know, how can we keep your tank full? And, and so keeping that top half of the tank full, it's very hard to do in the month of April in our field, but uh, that is something that is important to me. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, some other things that are new in our in our world. Uh, some of our testing options are new. Now, test optional in and of itself is not new. Um, you know, we know that there are some college, many colleges that have been test optional for decades. Uh, but of course, the growing movement in the last number of years, and then with COVID, I think about every most every college in the country is. Um, except when a handful, most all are test optional. This year, uh, more, more than ever, we're seeing some, some schools, some very well-respected schools move to test blind. 
And so as we work with students uh, to, to describe to them what all this means is a challenge. I referenced, I have four kids earlier. They're all you know teenagers, as I said. I think they're on a, a, a mission to educate their, their classmates and their teachers about test optional. Just last week, my sophomore, Lucy, um, you know, she was in a class and, you know, some of the ACT Aspire or ACT something or other coming up in the, in the schools. And, you know, the teacher was going on about how important this was and it will prepare you for the ACT or the SAT and that there's no way you're going to get into college if you uh, don't take the, or if you don't do well on the ACT. And, and Lucy, of course, spoke up. She's like, well, what about test optional schools? And so she's trying to, you know, I'm so happy my kids are trying to educate those out there. Uh, my daughter, my oldest, Abby, is headed to um, the Atlanta area for college next year. And she applied test optional. And um, she was talking to one of her friends and who's, I think a junior and the student had just taken the ACT and was talking about, oh, I need to get that score up. And something else, a pet peeve of mine, it's when the students are asking each other their ACT scores. And so this friend asked Abby, you know, what was your ACT? Um, she said, oh, I didn't take it. Uh, you know, kept getting canceled. And so finally I'm like, Abby, apply test optional. I don't, you know, don't worry about it. And this student was just, her friend was just amazed. She's like, you mean to tell me you're going to an out of state college without having taken the ACT? So this is confusing because students here, they've heard it for years. Parents have heard it for years. Uh, you know, you've got to get that ACT or the SAT score, um, but educating people that it is okay with, without it. Now, we all know though that many of our state, some of our state scholarship programs do require the test score. You know, before we all gathered here today on the screen, a few of us were on the Zoom talking about, you know, doing our civic duty, writing legislate, you know, writing, uh, you know, politicians and such. I would love for see, to see those state requirements to go away for some of those state grants. That's not where we are now in Arkansas. So by no means can we tell our students that there is no worth in taking these tests, but just getting that the word out to our families that, yeah, you can apply to some incredible schools and, and go without the strongest of scores. That's gonna be an option. Uh, student sources are new. We know the, you know, some of the, the tried and true historical sources for names. And if, and if you're unaware, you know, what colleges do is we buy names. It's called uh, student search. Uh, right now, they're around 50 cents a name. Traditionally, uh, you buy names of test takers and then you reach out to them. You send them a brochure. You send them emails. You may, uh, you may get on their computer screens with IP address targeting and hope that they click or raise their hand or visit campus or do something to, 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 to express their interest in, in you back. As we just referenced, there are gonna be fewer numbers of students taking the ACT and the SAT. And so colleges are, and I, let me tell you, I'm okay with that. I really am. I, um, I, this is being recorded, I don't know how broadcast far or wide this is going to go. If there's one thing I would change in this college search process in our profession, I wish these tests would just simply go away. Um, but right now that's not where we are. But fewer students will be taking them. And so colleges, you know, we're asking, how are we going to get our search names? Where, where are these prospect lists going to come from? There are so many different ways. I get vendor <laughs> emails and calls all the time about different sources for names. Um, you know, I will share, you know, just a small sample. These are some of the, the programs that we partner with. Um, again, there are many more. This is not simply a Hendrix presentation, but I'm just talking about my own experience. Uh, College Express, you know, it's a platform where we put some information, some pictures, some links about our school and students who click or say, I'm interested, those names come into our system and so that we're able to engage with them more and recruit. We've had college, we've been partnered with College Express for a while. Within the last year, we've uh, partnered with, with uh, Niche. Uh, we're on the beginning phases of partnering with Raise Me. And so these are some different platforms 
where we're hoping students will be able to discover us again without some of those old methods of of you know buying the, as many names as as you know we used to be able to do simply because students are taking the test less admission events are new you know used to you know you'd have your standard open house where you'd bring people onto campus parade them around your on campus events your your travel we referenced travel earlier so the college fairs the high school visits the coffee shop conversations that we have we've had we've had to completely reinvent um, our, the model of, of engaging with students in, in that way from an event perspective. Uh, many colleges aren't even reopened for visits. I, I know that we, we at Hendricks, we shut down in March for visits and then in late July, we're able to reopen. We have just the daily visits. We have limited how many, fam how many students can come. We have a morning session and an afternoon session. The max number of individuals for each session is 20. We have the temperature checks as they come in. Um, of course, mask wearing is a requirement. Uh, you know, with the state having gone away with the mandate, you know, we're, we have been a little worried about having families challenge us about wearing masks, but so far we've, we've been pretty lucky. But as a, as a school, we have continued to mandate the, the masks and people fortunately have been pretty agreeable. Um, you know, we've had to spread people out more. The tour groups are smaller. Uh, we've had to buy the, the little microphones with the speakers where the tour guide will, will talk through that because we're encouraging people to spread out a little bit more when they are out on that campus walk. Um, you know, and so that, those are the in-person experiences. Uh, we're in some beginning stages of now to explore what, when we get back to opening, reopening, what will that look like? And we're using this as a time to, again, to reimagine, to reinvent that. For campus events, we, we don't feel compelled to do the same thing that we've always done. Do we need to have an event every weekend so we're, we're all worn out, so we're not able to serve ourselves or our students? Um, Again, trying to keep that tank full. The overnight visit, I think that's gonna go away. It is here. Um, and, and so I'm kind of glad about that. Again, I'm, I always look at the silver linings. We've had to move to virtual. And, and honestly, this is something that colleges should have done a long time ago. And, and so the, the virtual sessions, the, the virtual, um, you know, a couple of things that we've introduced at, at Hendrix, we've started an evening webinar series called Web Talks with the Hendrix Community, where we have a number of different uh, topics. Uh, last night, we had about 40 students at one. We've introduced some morning sessions uh, called uh, Coffee Chats. Um, Hendrix Family Coffee Chats is what they're called, where we they're targeted for parents and guardians. And we have our faculty on there, and we just engage, have good conversation for about um, 45 minutes to an hour on some mornings. Those have been a hit with some parents. Um, it will be really interesting, you know, next year, what virtual, what we keep a virtual and what we try to turn back into maybe some travel events. Um, but anyway, whole new world with what that programming looks like. You know, something else that is new is, is, uh, you know, demographic trends are new. Uh, there is a, um, you know, a lot of research, you know, having been discussed in these last few years about something called the, the demographic uh, cliff. Um, when the recession hit and the housing market went bust, it was what, 08 or so, there was a pretty significant decrease in uh, birth rate, birth rates around our country move forward about 18 years. What this means is in around 2026 for colleges, high schools, some of you probably seeing it now, but in 2026, there's going to be a pretty marked decrease in the number of 18 year olds who are graduating from, from high school. So in a world where this, this competition amongst colleges for students already feels pretty intense, it's just going to get even more uh, challenging in these in these next few years, and so colleges are thinking about you know what are some ways that you know that we can you know increase the demand for our schools. What are ways that we are you know can serve 
you know, students better so that they will want to join this community, our communities. So that is something, this is the section where it's, you know, what, what keeps Ryan up at night. Uh, so the demographic trends that we are experiencing are, are definitely new. Let's see, moving on. What's not new though, is hopefully uh, um, patience and kindness. Um, yeah, something else I've shared with the staff. I, earlier, I was talking about it, sharing with them what's important to me, and you know what I what I encourage our staff to do is to presume goodwill. You know, so when that family asks you the questions, where for you it's the twentieth time you've heard that question this week. For that family, it's the first time they're asking it, and so just making sure that we are showing dignity, showing respect to our families, to one another, and that if if something that you find challenging does coming up does come up, just encourage folks to have the initial response internally to be one where you presume goodwill, and 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 so that is something that I've I've definitely tried to do with myself and try to encourage others to do it as well. So hopefully that patience and the kindness these are not new in our communities. And with that, that's all I got. You know, I've shared um you know shared some of my info on the screen. Um, happy to be in correspondence with anyone. You know, whether it be about SACAC, about Hendrix, professional in general or, or life. Um, I'm looking forward to making new friends here in Arkansas. And I'm so happy that you've given me this chance to, um, you know, just share a little bit more about my experience and some things that are important to me and some trends that I've been seeing this year in this pandemic era. So with that, I'll stop talking, or excuse me, uh, I will stop talking and I'll stop sharing and just see if there are any questions that are on people's minds or see if this has prompted any sort of conversation. Ryan, I have a question for you, and I would love to hear even anybody's feedback on this. Um, we in Alabama are the same as you guys in Arkansas in that the state no longer has a mandated mask requirement. That ended on the 9th. Um, but on campus, we are still functioning with our masks. Um, uh, we heard from that you said that Hendrix is functioning that way as well, but um, just wondering about maybe your high schools and um, if if any of you have discussed kind of what you see the future. Um, maybe I would just love to hear kind of like Pamela said in the beginning. Um, I would love for somebody to say that I'm not the only one that is working on this, <laughs> this thought. <laughs> Okay, let's see, I'm seeing Emily share that masks are still required there. Not sure about fall. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll share about conversations here. Uh, right now, the plan is for masks in the fall. Uh, there has been some guidance uh, from CDC about with masks, maybe moving from the six feet distance to the three feet disc distance. So that's the current model that we're thinking. The hottest topic right now and the, probably the most heated conversation is about requiring vaccines of whether, whether or not we should do it. I mean, there's definitely, the general thought is that we will, will not, just because the nature of this is still, a, I mean, I, I was happy to roll up my sleeve and most of our faculty staff and most of our students were, but the truth is it's still experimental approval. And is it right to require something um, where it's technically still under experimental approval. There are some very strong feelings on campus uh, about us having to requirement, require it of students next year. But then yesterday's news with Johnson & Johnson about that going, that hall team, internally it's like, is that right to do? So I don't have a good answer there, but I know it's a hot topic right now on our campus. And I suspect a lot of other campuses. <laughs> At Arkansas State, uh, Catherine, uh, when the announcement first came out that the mask mandate may, you know, expire um, at the end of March, it was kind of as if it like 
that's what I was like, we're still wearing masks. Um, and that's just what we're going to do um, on campus. I think for us, um, a, an institution that's a regional institution that has a lot of cross application with other institutions in the state, we're really trying to push more of a narrative of trying to comfort parents and students in the fact that we are going to try to be as normal in the fall as possible and not necessarily focusing as much on whether we're going to have masks or if it's going to be three feet or if it's going to be six feet. I think for a lot of students that we attract, again, that are also looking at institutions like UCA or Arkansas Tech or UA Fort Smith um, across the state, they kind of want to know if they're going to have a freshman experience or not, um, or if they're going to be like their friends last year who, you know, some of them really didn't get to have those on-campus experiences like they thought they would. Um, so, you know, right now our narrative is more focused on, you know, hey, we are planning to be in person in the fall. Now, whether that's, you know, in-person masks, in-person six feet, in-person three feet, you know, those types of details um, are not really something that's like the major focus of what we're trying to communicate to students right now. Um, I know those conversations are happening, um, I don't think here in Arkansas, especially in Northeast Arkansas, I don't think it's even worth having the conversation of mandating vaccines. Um, and that's just, if you're from Arkansas, you've been in Arkansas for a very long time, you kind of know what I'm saying, like without saying it. Um, I just don't, you know, Michael's shaking his head. It's like, yep, mm -hmm. that's just not something that's going to fly um, in this, particularly in this part of the state. And so I don't anticipate that we'll start having that conversation at all um, for students or for staff or faculty or anything like that. Um, but, you know, we're, unfortunately or fortunately, we're trying to kind of bring back some normalcy um, to what we're gonna do for the upcoming fall. And we wanna focus on that as much as possible. Yeah, I know from my experience, I have um, graduates from 2020 who went to a four-year school and I've had to talk to a few of them because they were getting kind of bummed out because I'm virtual, you know, and uh, I was like, I don't want to be virtual next year. I'm thinking about going somewhere else. And I was like, are you sure you want to do that? Because this is going to end up going away, you know, uh, there'll be more regulations in place probably, but you'll have more freedoms next year. So I think I've got her talked in and still go to, she's going to UCA, but to go to UCA next year. So, uh, but that's what some of our freshmen right now in college are dealing with. It's, you know, man, this was a bad year. Is it going to be like that this year? And I agree with what you're saying, Pamela, on getting that narrative out there about we're going to be on campus. We're going to have some normalcy and events for our students. So. Okay, any other uh, thoughts or questions for Ryan? Thank you all. Um, I appreciate the welcome I've received here um, and look forward to when we can be around in person. I'll see a lot of you next week at the state meeting for the conference. And I, I do a, a, I have a, a, one of our current students who's going to do some shadowing of interested in enrollment today. So I'm going to step aside uh, from Zoom in a few minutes. So sorry to miss the rest of the programming today, but thank you for being a part of it and especially to our organizers, uh, Matthew and Emily. All right, Ryan, thanks. We look forward to you buying the Stobies next time we can do that. So um, all right, uh, now we're going to uh, switch gears a little bit and we're going to hear from uh, Emily Coffey of uh, Mount St. Mary's Academy in Little Rock and uh, our uh, out-of-state guest, Melissa Klein uh, from Furman in South Carolina. So um, let them get their presentation ready. Yeah, thank you guys for letting me be an imposter, imposter, or how do you say, or Kansan? for the day. I used to recruit in Arkansas, so it's nice to see some familiar faces and be back amongst friends, even though we're over Zoom. <laughs> 
Oh, are y'all seeing that really awful? Please move this shared window away from something or other. Is that popping up there? Oh. Did. Melissa, do you actually want to be the one to share your Absolutely. slides? Will that bother you? <laughs> no, I've got a dual screen. Let me just pull it up real quick. No worries. Oh, sorry, team. This happened to me the, the other week and I thought I read how to fix it and I thought it was fixed. I am learning it is not fixed. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I'm pull it up. Yeah, so it's a nice transition from Ryan talking about ethic or a conversation of ethics and vaccinations. So we'll talk more about ethics and college admissions. Ryan got his presentation loaded so smoothly and it went great. So we we had to throw a little hiccup in. I I take the blame. No worries. When we think about it, at our in-person conferences, we give presenters at least, what, 10, 15 minutes in a room <laughs> by themselves to get ready and set for their presentation. So <laughs> this whole virtual world has um, taken that 10 to 15 minutes away from us. So I think you guys are doing great. And, and in Emily's defense, we did test it out and it worked flawlessly um, initially. So, um, oh, y'all know nothing goes the way you actually think <laughs> it right? All right. So, I'm going to ask that question. Can you all see the presentation? Perfect. Yes. All right, Emily. Well, I'll go ahead and um, kick us off. And um, again, thank you so much for letting me join this group. I'm excited to be with you all this morning. Um, and I know he's not on the call anymore, but Ryan's presentation was just a helpful reminder to find the joy on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that colleagues who are working with high school students right now probably need that reminder. And I certainly need that reminder as well as we get um, through the next couple of weeks leading up to May 1. Um, but Emily and I are excited to spend some time with you this morning discussing NACAC's Guide to Ethical Practices in College Admissions. And it is a mouthful, so you might hear us refer to it as GEFCA um, at some point in the presentation because it is a mouthful. So um, we're going to spend a little bit of time um, walking you through um, some history of how we got to where we are and next steps as it relates to the Admissions Practices Committee and our role both with NACAC and SACAC moving forward. Um, I know some of you in the audience, although I haven't had the pleasure of meeting everyone formally, so, um, you know, among you, there might be, mem you know, full members of NACAC or SACAC, there might be some individuals joining us who um, have very various degrees of understanding and knowledge um, of ethical practices in college admissions. Um, so whether you've been in this profession for 15 plus years, maybe you've served in various capacities within college admissions, within SACAC, or maybe this is your first engagement with SACAC in general, our hope for today's presentation um, is that you leave with um, a good understanding of the work that's been done historically, the work that's being done to move us forward, um, and how we can continue to champion ethical practices in our profession, truly for the benefit of our students. Um, so just wanna take a minute to formally introduce ourselves to you. I'll kick it over to you, Emily. Um, I'll be brief since <laughs> I, I met y'all earlier today and I know a lot of you, but I'm Emily and this is my first and unfortunately only year on the SACAC board serving as co-chair with Melissa on the Admission Practices Committee. Um, some of you know my family and I are moving to DC this summer, uh, which is a happy and a sad um, for my husband's job, but I'm really happy to have had the chance to serve on the SACAC board and learn a lot more about admission practices this year. Awesome. Well, we're definitely going to miss you. I'm going to miss you as co-chair, but um, hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Klein. I serve as director of admissions at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. I've worked in college admissions um, at Furman um, for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years in August, and this will be this next year will be my third year serving as admissions practices committee co-chair um, for the SACAC board. Um, and although our role as an AP committee has been somewhat in a state of transition over the past couple of years, 
Emily and I have been working very hard on some ideas this year, and we're excited um, to see the direction that the committee is going to take um, in the years to come and really hoping that you all can provide some input and feedback for us throughout the presentation um, to help us move that conversation forward. Um, we're going to skip our SAC Act plug because Pamela did an A plus job in the beginning, but uh, if you're not a member, you should join and we'll see you at the conference next week. Absolutely. All right, so I'll give you all um, an overview of what we're hoping to accomplish today. So our goal is to provide you first and foremost with a historical framework um, for the function of ethical practices in college admissions. Um, we'll discuss the evolving role of the admissions practices committee. We'll also talk about some current issues in the college admissions landscape that you all may be acutely familiar with through your roles as college counselors. Um, and really hope to get a chance for your feedback and input on what you're seeing and, and what are some goals that we can work towards to help educate our profession um, and membership a little bit better about ethical practices. All right, so let's jump into it. So um, you may or may not know that the Admissions Practices Committee is one of the required standing committees for each NACAC affiliate. Um, and it really, we've played a pivotal role in ensuring member institutions live up to um, the established guidelines and best practices for how we conduct business. Um, so we want to give you a historical framework for where we've come from and where we're moving forward. Um, so since 1937, NACAC has grown to be the largest trade organization focusing on college admissions. And throughout its 80 plus year history, elements of ethical practices and professional standards have been a really important component for training, networking, um, collaboration among its various institutions. So originally known as the Statement of Principles and Guiding Practices, or SPGP, for those who may um, remember, this document has seen many iterations over the years. And at its core, um, it served as the guiding recommendations, best practices, um, in some areas, expected behavior for how member institutions would conduct admissions business. Um, really ethical behavior has been a cornerstone of the profession since NACAC was founded. In uh, September 2017 at the National Conference, the SPGP um, transitioned into a new iteration. Um, it had been a while since it had seen a significant overhaul. Um, in this new version, which long title, Statement of Principles and Guiding Practices, the Code of Ethics and Professional Practices. Wow, that is a mouthful, the CEPP for short. Um, this new document provided clear ethical principles and rules for how um, AP would help to implement that. Um, this really was done in an effort to ensure the protection of students from unethical recruitment practices. And maybe those you all might have examples from your own career and working with students where you felt that decisions made by colleges or universities really um, hindered students in their in their college search process. Um, so some of the in this new iteration, some of the, all of the provisions were mandated. And what happened almost immediately after that change in November 2017, um, the Department of Justice began. Um, a contacted NACAC about um, some antitrust issues, specifically related to three components of the CEPP. Um, the first being the active recruiting of transfer students in the CEPP that was not allowed. Um, the second being offering incentives as part of the early decision process. So that was um, a mandated um, rule that colleges should not do that. And third, the act of recruiting first year freshmen after May 1. In response to the Department of Justice investigation, the NACAC Assembly then voted to place a moratorium on the enforcement of these three specific provisions while the investigation took place. So three pretty critical components for how member colleges and universities conduct business. Um, but when you look at it through the lens of the Sherman Act, which is what prohibits restriction of trade or reduction of competition in the marketplace, these three rules were viewed as unlawfully restraining competition among NACAC member colleges. Um, and their argument was it may demonstrate harm to college applicants or potential transfer students. 
So through this lens, these provision, provisions also ran the risk of um, potentially depriving students of benefits that result from colleges competing for students. Um, example, the main example being com competition among financial aid packages. So two years later, um, it's in September of 2019 at the National Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, the NACAC Assembly voted to remove those three concerning provisions from the CEPP. Um, and then one month later, the NACAC board in conjunction with the DOJ agreed to the terms of the consent decree. So you're getting a lot of history about where we've come from. Um, although the consent dec decree was accepted by the DOJ, the moratorium that had been placed on the CEP remained in place from fall 2017 to fall 2020. So when I opened and said that we've been in a period of transition, um, much of what our committee had historically done was compliance, ensuring that institutions were following the SPGP, then the CEPP. So for the past couple of years, we've been in a state of um, awaiting more information about how our committee can move forward. So during this period of time, we did not follow up on any complaints or violations against the CEPP. With the hopes of avoiding future issues regarding antitrust within our guiding documents, the NACAC Board of Directors recommended that the National AP Committee recast the document as a best practices model. Um, and it is it has been a process to get to this point. Um, lots of thoughtful conversations, strategic format and soliciting feedback, um, conversations among delegates, among affiliate, affiliate leadership, surveys to membership to really best understand what the ongoing needs are of our members um, to then be able to craft this new best practices model. Um, at, after the National AP Committee's work in researching similar organizations, ethical codes, um, again, considering that feedback from membership, working alongside legal counsel, um, the results were shared with the board in February, 2020. Um, and then one month later, the board charged the National AP Committee with drafting this best practices version of the CEPP. Um, the hope being that it will continue to safeguard the best interests of students, um, clearly articulate the organization's values and ethical priorities. April 2020, we saw the final judgment from the DOJ, um, so able to move forward. Um, as part of that, NACAC will be monitored for the next five to seven years, ensuring that we comply with all facets of the consent decree. And at this point is when formal work really began on um, creating this next document. I'll turn it over to Emily to get us even more up to speed. <laughs> um, speaking of speed, things really picked up speed in June of 2020, and that's when the NACAC Board of Directors approved the draft um, of the new proposed guide. And so the next step that, that um, NACAC members had to do was provide feedback about the draft. And so members did that via email this summer um, in a survey. And overall, NACAC was pretty pleased with the representation and the response rate to the survey. Um, and based off of that information, they created what became the final draft of the guide. And so this brings us to August of 2020. And that's when the draft of the guide is shared with the membership before our virtual conference that we had in September. And prior to the conference, NACAC membership had the opportunity to vote via an electronic ballot to approve replacing the CEPP with the guide. Um, and so kind of all of this, um, I came in on the admission practices committee in April. So like right when the ball was like rolling a little faster and a lot of the conversation that we have was where does our admission practices committee fit into the conversation now? Because as Melissa mentioned, as we're the only required standing committee that has to be um, included in all the affiliates, uh, we've had a long-standing role in compliance, but now we are shifting over into an educational model. And so as evidenced by the timeline, you might be thinking like, there have been so many changes. What is the same? Uh, 
But first off, the guide continues to keep the best interests of our students at heart. Chances are, if someone asks you like, oh, why do you do your job? You are most likely gonna say, I do it for my students because we all know you do not do it for the money. Uh, and in the guide, most of these formally mandatory practices have remained. Now they are simply recommended practices. Uh, so an example of this is providing guidance and information to help students determine their best academic, personal, and financial match college, and then maintaining the recommended deadlines of May 1 for deposit and October 15 for earliest application submission deadline. Um, something that I really liked in the pre preamble of the guide is the statement that NACAC's guide to ethical practice in college admission is the conscience of our profession. It can guide our actions in the face of current and emerging pressures. It empowers us to build trust and find common ground while we work to ensure that every student's dignity, worth, and potential are realized in the transition to post-secondary education. While the heart of the document has remained the same, um, and it's the moral compass that guides our work, um, that has not changed, there are some tactical adjustments to the document that um, we wanted to outline. Under the guide, um, as we've mentioned, all provisions are now best practices and recommendations. So there is no enforcement or mandated expectations. So um, the former era of compliance and contacting the admissions practices committee, if there was an issue, um, we're moving past that. So we will not follow up on any complaints or concerns, but our role moving forward will really, really be through education and advocacy, which we'll talk a little bit more um, in just a minute. So it does mark that significant shift from how NACAC, the National AP Committee, the affiliate committees, how we operate from here on out. Um, so really focusing again on the education advocacy. Although the recommend practices are less specific than the mandatory practices once were, um, the guide now includes much more descriptive text of NACAC's core values. Um, it includes more interactive links that will help to support those recommended practices. Um, there are no sanctions for non-compliance under the guide, um, but really the hope is that the moral compass of our organization is also the moral compass of our member institutions and our member individuals. Um, to really continue us on a path steered by ethical behavior, truly, again, for the benefit of our students. So big questions are, how can we as a profession continue to strive for ethical excellence, especially during these times? We've been tested, you know, we thought 2019 college admissions scandal, Operation Varsity Blues, we thought that was gonna be the bulk of it. And now we're, you know, pandemic time. So, um, you know, how can we continue to be ethical in any scenario? How can we as an admissions practices committee appropriately support and advocate for ethical behavior moving forward? And how do we demonstrate the benefits of acting ethically without the compliance measures to hold, um, hold us accountable? So Emily, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, so for the future, we are continuing the work of NACAC as a guardian of ethical practice without the ability to enforce our principles for practice will be an important part of our work as we move forward. The ad hoc committee report on leadership in college admission states, the Department of Justice investigation into NACAC's code of ethics on restraint of trade grounds has resulted in an irreversible change in direction for NACAC one that seems destined to move us beyond a role in which we self-regulate to one in which we must advocate and rely on our core values to represent what is good and noble in higher education admission, while also naming what is wrong and detrimental. Now that you all, you've seen the strong historical framework from, for NACAC's ethical guidelines, um, here's really where we begin our next phase and where your input will be immensely moving forward. Um, the ability to care, carry out the charge of advocacy and education moving forward rests on three main pillars. First and foremost, advocating for critical issues and equipping our membership to advocate for themselves and their students. 
and for educational policies at institutions and or the state level as well. So there you might be even more crossover with um, legislative, le legislative issues as an example. Um, secondly, clearly communicating with our members the intrinsic benefits of operating ethically. And, and communicating with our members might mean communicating with our members so they can communicate with their respective board of directors, board of regents, with various departments across campus, as an example. Um, and again, communicating the why behind, behind ethical behavior. Um, this approach will only be successful if we're also educating our membership our students, um, that is a, an audience that we've not historically been in direct communication with, but ways that we can encourage our students to advocate for themselves, and also non-members as we move along this new path. Um, for much of this year, our committee, um, the NACAC uh, National Committee, have been working to construct um, some scenario examples to demonstrate the ways in which we can continue to strive for this excellence um, under a best practices model. Um, and I'm gonna turn over to Emily to highlight some of the work that we've been doing this year. Um, so uh, we looked at a few different scenarios and tried to pick a couple that feel very timely to where we are right now in, in our cycle. So we're in the, the exciting yield season. Um, I think it's a little more exciting on the high school side because we, we see our little children going off to all their big places. And then on the college side, y'all are anxiously waiting for our students to come your way, right? Um, so a scenario that I often find myself in is one dealing with confidentiality um, of student choices. So a scenario is during lunch, not that we're like really congregating together now, so it's more in like passing in the hallway, um, a teacher will come up and say like, oh, Emily, where is Elizabeth going to college? I bet she applied to some really big name schools. How much scholarship money has she received? Like, has she made her decision? Um, and you all know that they're just so excited, right, to support your students. They're also excited to kind of put like a little feather in the cap of your school, like, oh, they're going to, to this place. Like, that's really exciting. Um, but the problem is, is that according to the guide, it's recommended um, that members shouldn't divulge an individual student's college application status admission, enrollment, or financial aid and scholarship offers without express permission from the student. Um, and so this kind of puts you in like a weird spot, or I mean, honestly, it puts me in a weird spot. I feel uncomfortable, right? Because I, I wanna be nice and kind to the teacher, but I also don't wanna share information that the student has not allowed me to share. So, some of the language that I use, and you might find this helpful, and if y'all have a better way to handle this, <laughs> please unmute yourself and let me know or put it in the chat. Um, but I try to divert the conversation. So I'll say like, you know, Elizabeth has some future plans that she is really excited about, but I don't have her permission to share this information with you. Um, but the class of 2021 is making some exciting choices. Over half of our students have already decided where they're going, and I'm so excited for the rest of them to make up their mind. Um, or I'm really proud of them. We've raised eight million in scholarship dollars this year, and the number is counting. So we've got some great things going. So I steer it away from the specific student, and I give them a little information about like the class as a whole. But if y'all have any idea on how to make that better or what you say, does anyone have something different to navigate your kind of like sticky workplace friend conversations? Emily, I don't run into those similar conversations since I'm on the college side, but I will tell you within this particular topic, we um, every year will be contacted by a counselor or a representative for certain high schools asking us to divulge scholarship amounts awarded to specific students. And so we run into very similar sticky situations where we're not technically allowed to report that out. 
at the individual level um, and have to navigate conversations with counselors around why we can't divulge that information without the express consent of the student. So um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for you specifically, but just to kind of provide some additional context there. Um, anybody else have something to share? Oh, yes, that is a really good idea um, to have the students like self-select what information they want to share for a college signing day. We do like the, and if anyone has a better idea for this, we do like the college decision bulletin board um, where we have like the name of the school and then a student can opt in to be uh, included in that. Um, but collecting more information via that survey is uh, a really good idea and probably a change I'll make this year. Um, another thing that y'all might be encountering, and we're a, a touch past kind of when this usually happens, um, but it's when a student is asked to make a college decision by X date that is before May 1. So um, let's say John, which is funny because I don't work with anybody named John, but John has been admitted to the Honors College at X University. Um, and this offer is contingent upon him formally enrolling in the program and to the institution by March 15th, which y'all know is obviously way before May 1. And so like John is so pumped about this opportunity to be in the Honors College, like this is one of his dreams, but he is still waiting to hear back from some other institutions via regular decision. Um, he's got some pretty big names on his list, so he's hearing back around that spring break time, um, which is way after May 5th. Well, this year it was four days after May 15, but it's, excuse me, after March 15. Um, he doesn't want to miss out on the opportunity of going to this honors college, but he also doesn't want to make a decision before he hears back from his other schools. He needs to know those scholarship offers and those admission offers, so he makes his best choice. So John is sitting across from you in your office, and he's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Because John is smart, and he has asked for your advice instead of his best friend's advice. Um, let me know if you've trained all your students to do that, because working on it still. Um, so why is this problematic that John has been asked to make a decision before May 1? Um, in order to serve our students the best, the guide recommends that we stand by the national candidate reply date of May 1 as the earliest enrollment confirmation deadline. And before a student is um, making an enrollment decision and a commitment to each institution, they should have the time to compare their financial aid and scholarship offers, um, and they should also um, still have availability to housing and things of that nature. And so members are encouraged to work with other campus offices um, to create a consistent deadline that doesn't require students to make a commitment or accept an offer prior to May 1. And so the guide has a lot of information um, about kind of complying with that May 1 deadline. So as a counselor, you should feel, um, we could do two things, right? Um, you could call the office and say like, hey, I've got this student who'd love to come, but like they really need an extension and here is why I think this is a fair ask. And so you could kind of quote some of the language from the guide. If you're taking notes, it is outlined in section two, part A. Um, this is also being recorded um, and also easily found online. But one of the new jobs of the AP committee is not only to empower you as a counselor, um, us, I'm us as a counselor, um, but also empower the students we work with. Um, and my kids like hate making phone calls, but this is a time when I would walk them through, like, you know what, this is a time when we need to call them and let them know um, that they would really love an extended deadline so that they could make the best decision for themselves. 
and kind of walk the office through why this is important to them. And most of the time when people are, when institutions have made mistakes or set policies that don't align with what the guide recommends, it's often by accident. And so usually just a very kind and polite ask backed up by why it's important to you or to the student is going to be successful. Uh, now, Melissa and I like came up with a lot of different other scenarios and practice like language that we could use to be persuasive in our asks. Um, is there anything that y'all like to add about this scenario or maybe share a moment of triumph or despair that you have had this year in advocating for yourself or a student? I will mention this um, and I shut my door, um, but I work specifically in um, the College of Architecture, Design and Construction at Auburn University. And one of the programs within our college before I started working here um, would ask that students um, place their deposit to secure a spot in some specific coursework that is required in the first semester. The thing is, is that at the time that they used to send this letter, I was working in the university admissions office. The admissions office had no idea that this college was sending out this statement to their admitted students saying, hey, you've got to place your deposit. Um, and that was an interesting thing just because when the admissions office got notified, we were all like, whoa, 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 this will get us kicked out of NACAC. And obviously with the changes that have been made, um, you know, it's a little bit different, but nonetheless, um, that was something that it allowed our admissions office to just educate um, this college a little bit more about, guys, it is totally okay that we ask them to submit a preference or that we ask them to notify whether or not if they did choose to come to Auburn that they would be interested in this. It's also totally okay to put May 1 uh, as the deadline. We love that. Um, but we cannot put a date before May 1 as it does put these students in that difficult situation. And, you know, that was something that um, we were working with faculty that, let's be honest, most faculty have no clue what we do on a daily basis. And so um, it definitely required a lot of education, but it was also one of those things that it allowed me to see the other side of the desk of this person, you know, could be getting this letter and they take it to their college counselor. And then their college counselor says, we need to contact the admissions office. And then the admissions office, you know, it, it just can sometimes go a lot deeper than just simply the admissions office being so blatantly against it. And so I would, the biggest thing only because I, I work with it and now I'm the person who sends that letter and you best believe it says May 1. Um, but the thing is, is that I would say also, um, I, I so appreciate the relationships that I have with my counselors where they can pick up the phone and say, hey, Catherine, we have gotten something a little weird. Can you explain it to us? And um, where, you know, like Emily said in the beginning, we're here for our students. And um, when I got that call when I was in admissions, I was like, oh, God, that should not have been sent. Please, I'm so sorry. Let me get to the bottom of it. So I also think that it just kind of comes down to even just picking up the phone and saying, hey, can we have an offline conversation about something that we got? Don't know if it came from you or if you were even aware of it, because um, in my experience, people do want to be ethical and they want to follow ethical practices. Um, just sometimes honors colleges and architecture programs go rogue and that's fine. We just allows us to educate even more. So that's a, a personal, personal statement that I will say with my door closed and loving my job, for sure. What a perfect example. I mean, definitely, I mean, the large, you, we see it at small institutions as well. So, I mean, um, I'll give you another example from Furman. We were, we're a tiny fraction the size of Auburn University, but um, working with one of our institutes that wanted to advertise a summer program to incoming freshmen, and use the language of secure your spot by April 15th and we'll 
take $500 off the registration. And it's a matter of just educating different departments that your language of scholarship, we need to transition that to discount. We also can't set an early date because it needs to fall in line. And it's a matter of people just not understanding the admissions landscape. Um, and so much of what we're hoping to do moving forward is to provide really great resources for admissions offices to be able to communicate with board of directors, with um, senior council levels, to be able to explain the why behind these particular dates. Um, but wow, what a great example. <laughs> so Catherine and Melissa from the high school perspective, when we encounter our students confronted with um, decisions like that, um, you know, what advice would you give to a high school counselor who sees their student, uh, you know, kind of having the squeeze put on them and you know it's not right and you know somebody at that college knows it's not right. Um, what would your recommended course of action? So this is a great test of the future of the AP committee. Um, I, I mean, I, I would hope that there is a strong enough relationship at the institution to be able to call um, and to advocate. And, and maybe there are scenarios where that institution is not a member of NACAC or maybe very unfamiliar with the fact that we even have an ethical code um, and being able to reference, hey, within the guide, within this section, we're really putting our student at a disadvantage that they're now having to make a decision because of this stated deadline. Is there any flexibility there? Um, and it, Emily just mentioned this, but you know, when we were faced with compliance issues, so much of it was just a matter of not being educated on the fact that there were these um, recommended dates of May 1 and um, trying to get away from early decision incentives. And when addressing those institutions specifically with places in the CEPP where it stated it was, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, we will fix this and work with that student individually. Um, I would like to hope that there and have faith that those situations could be resolved in that way. Um, but I also think this is the chance for us to learn from one another. So if, if you have examples where you have navigated those conversations and how it went, I mean, that can help us continue to build a framework of bulleted examples of what to say and how to handle from the student and counselor perspective. I would also say, I think that, um, uh, and I, I've never been on the high school side, but I now work a lot more with my current students than I ever did in admissions. And I'm real big on empowering them. They make the phone call, they do those sorts of things. But I will say this could definitely be a situation where um, the phone call that I got when I was originally notified of this was a counselor that would say, hey, I normally would not make this phone call, but I'm going to make this phone call only because I don't want to send this kid into you know, potentially the fire want to notify you of this, that kind of a thing. And I will say, I so appreciated that coming from the counselor only because, um, you know, I, if the student would have made the call, um, they might not have understood exactly what they were asking as much. Or if the parent made the phone call, it might have ended up being a, a very negative interaction. Whereas when that counselor made the phone call, it was more of a like, hey, Catherine, um, you met me once, but I'm guessing you're a functioning adult who works in, you know, under NACAC. So let me ask you this question. And um, and it ended up being a, a great conversation. Um, but I was very thankful that it came from the counselor directly um, just because it allowed me to one patch that, you know, and let the counselor know that that was not the the what what Auburn wanted to uh, portray ever to our students and build a better relationship with the counselor. And then it also allowed me to kind of prep the counselor for how we were going to communicate with the student and fix the error that had occurred. So the counselor also knew kind of from my side. So I would say that I really appreciated that coming directly from the counselor as opposed to that coming from the student. Um, but alas, that just means one more thing on your plate. <laughs> Love adding things, but that I, I just just kind of say that. I think that's a great point, Catherine. And I think I have to imagine from the student perspective, being charged with 
let me contact the admissions office with an issue and it wouldn't happen, but the fear of, are they going to take the, my admissions decision away? Or is it going to impact anything? Am I going to go in with a bad reputation? Um, so there's probably some perception issues there. Um, and in that particular example, coming from a counselor may result in more lasting change. Whereas if it's one individual student, I would hope that the, the whole situation would be resolved moving forward, but um, the goal being that we can educate across the board. Um, but I think it's a great example of why it's important that we educate students about the guide and that there are these parameters that we really hope colleges and in high schools and all institutions will abide by or follow or um, to, to help make sure they're more informed in the in the admissions process because the times that I've made reference to formally this SPGP or the CEPP to a student it's like deer in headlights they have no idea what that is or why I'm saying they have until May 1 so um, yeah education's got to be a huge part of it. Um, this is a wonderful segue, Melissa, where you were talking about um, kind of our future and where we are heading. Um, I know that sometimes I love a QR code, but then I was thinking like, you know what, we are on our work computers and we probably don't want a work thing on our cell phones. So I've dropped the link in the chat. Um, this is your chance to talk to NACAC. So with the three pillars of advocacy, education, and communication in mind, NACAC wants to hear from y'all SACAC members. Um, so ideally, this is how the kind of work of the AP committee going forward is going to be shaped. And so in this Google form that you've got, um, which you, the responses are anonymous. So like, you're not gonna hurt anybody's feelings or mess up any professional opportunities for yourself. Um, we have a few questions um, that we would love to get answers from. And if you're like me, um, your best responses are gonna come like when you're driving your car a week from today. So please take your time, um, think about what you would like to put in here and um, this is the same presentation that Melissa and I are giving at SACAC conference next week. So first, don't come to it again. Um, second, you have like two and a half weeks to put your responses in. So we would really, truly appreciate anything you can give us because this is um, how we are representing the SACAC voice to the NACAC AP committee. Um, so these are our three questions here. Um, and then on our next slide, we've got a few more questions that are also going to appear in that Google form. Um, yes. And I think, so the, the first three questions really are the biggest ones from a NAC perspective. And the ones here are really, it, it will all be immensely helpful, but how SACAC specifically, you know, what observed trends you're seeing within uh, within the South to help us um, build content and presentations and handouts, whatever that format may look like, that's going to best help you and your students. So um, I will just echo what Emily said. Please give us your thoughts and your feedback on this. Um, Kath, I really appreciate your examples and sharing with us some things that you've worked through. Um, I'd love maybe for maybe just the next couple, like one to two minutes, are there any you're thinking about the last question, what are the issues and ethical um, lapses that are concerning you right now? Are there any trends that you're seeing that you wanna bring forward and maybe discuss as a group? Um, when it comes to, I guess students who don't have college counseling, um, because there are so many students who might not have that access or parents or families, um, they might not understand that language. And how do we be responsible to have student and parent facing information that can serve as a guide when they might not have someone else who can either advocate for them or explain it to them? 
gosh, that's such great feedback. Um, and I think that's will be immensely important to have it. Um, information that's digestible by different audiences. So how we talk to counselors, how we talk to um, university boards versus how we talk to a student or a parent or a guardian. Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't have I don't have an answer for you other than to say I fully agree. And I think that needs to be a direction that we move forward in. I don't have any answers or thoughts <laughs> to it yet either. I just, it was just in the back of my mind. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. Anything else? Well, take some time, mull it over. Please fill out the form. We would love your feedback. Um, and if there are ways that you want to help with this. Um, so again, we've historically been a committee of, of two focused on the compliance piece. And now it's a committee of however many to help us get that message out. So if you have an interest in um, ethical behavior and helping in that way, we would love for you to think about volunteering with us. Um, whether that volunteer role means coming up with the scenarios or coming up with the best ways to format documents for various audiences, coming up with the messaging um, or giving presentations at the various SACAC events. We would love to have you join us um, or any additional feedback or concerns you have. We hope you'll connect with us through our admission practices at SACAC.org email. Um, but thank you guys so much for listening and engaging and providing your feedback on this. And that formally concludes all the content that we have. All right, uh, Emily, Melissa, thank you so much uh, for joining us um, from near and far. Um, <laughs> we um, uh, have lost by attrition uh, several people, which I guess is one of the um, plus sides to a virtual conference, uh, makes that a little bit more um, flexible for, for everybody. Um, but I'm going to wrap up now, just adding the, um, the link once again, to sign up, uh, for the conference, uh, next week, if you haven't already, uh, it would be nice to see, um, your faces again. And just because it has opportunities have felt rather few and far between this year. Um, I want to thank, uh, uh, everybody for being here on a soggy um, Wednesday morning. And just uh, so everybody knows, there will be an email uh, going out from me once they have, you know, cleaned up the recording and I get that or I'll send this recording out. So uh, you can revisit it in all of its glory um, or, you know, catch some uh, parts that maybe you um, uh, attention lapsed a little bit or you got pulled away. Um, I'll also be sending out the evaluation uh, for this particular meeting so you can give us uh, feedback on how we did, uh, what we can do better, um, and maybe some topics and things you'd like to see next time. I'll also include uh, Emily Melissa's link as well. So uh, with that, uh, this concludes this uh, drive-in workshop or sit-in workshop, uh, whatever we want to uh, phrase it. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time, your intention, and your engagement. And we'll see you next week, right?